Well, I tell you what, if you have your Bibles, let's jump right into God's Word. We're going to go to 1 John chapter 5. We're going to read the first five verses this morning in 1 John chapter 5. So when you get there, 1 John 5 verse 1, let me hear you say amen. And if you're joining us at home, we encourage you to follow along in God's Word as well. Here's what it says to us. Whosoever believeth that Jesus is the Christ is born of God, and everyone that loveth Him that begat loveth Him also that is begotten of Him. By this we know that we love the children of God when we love God and keep His commandments. For this is the love of God that we keep His commandments and His commandments are not grievous. Uh, For whatsoever is born of God overcometh the world and this is the victory that overcometh the world, even our faith. Who is He, or excuse me, who is He that overcometh the world, but he that believeth that Jesus is the Son of God. Church, let's, uh, let's just ask God one more time for His favor and for Him to be with us as we go through His Word this morning. Father God, thank You once again for the opportunity to be here. Father, I pray that as we go through this text this morning that You just speak life into us. Father, I pray You encourage the one who may be battered uh, and bruised from life in their, in their faith with You. Father, I, I pray for the one who may not know You this morning that You will call out and this will be the day that they, uh, that they shake off those shackles of self-reliance and the ties that they have to this world and pursue a life of following Christ. And Father, I pray this morning for the believer that is on fire for you, the one that's serving, the one who's faithful. Father, I pray that this message is encouraging. I pray this is this message is support. I pray this message is reaches out to them and sustains them in their following of you. And Father, I pray that everything that's said and done, you look favorably upon and that nothing that any of us do, including me, first and foremost, does nothing to hinder anyone's worship of you this morning. I just pray that you tarry with us but a little while. And it's in Jesus' name I pray these things. Amen. Do you believe God can speak to you this morning? I believe He can too. You see, I have a question for you, and it's pretty straight to the point. Do you have faith in Jesus this morning? For those who said yes or amen or even thought that in your mind, what has your faith done for you? Can you point to a specific moment, a specific time? Could you write down right now one thing that your faith has done? One thing that has materialized because of your faith in Jesus. If you can't, or excuse me, if you can, then what was the outcome? If you said no or or thought no to that question, well, let me ask you a question. Why is it that you don't have faith in Christ? And what exactly is it that you have faith in? Because believe it or not, you've exercised faith multiple times just this morning. So what is it that you have faith in and what are those results? You will see the outcomes of living by faith. Which is why I asked the, uh, the Christian this morning the follow-up question of what has your faith done for you? What can you see from your faith? Is it church attendance? Is it mentioning the name of God during a conversation? Is it posting on social media? Is it maybe some type of service? What is it that your faith has done for you? Now, if you're a follower of Jesus, then by default, that means you've put your faith in Him. Because after all, that's what being a follower of Jesus is all about. But how do you exercise it? How do you know that you are putting your faith, that faith in Christ, into practice? You see, in the book of 2 Chronicles chapter 20, it tells us, believe in the Lord your God, so uh, shall ye be established. Believe his prophets, so shall ye prosper. You see, it doesn't just stop with saying you have faith in Christ. See, there, there are things that happen after that point in which you can, you can easily point to and say, you know what, I am living a faithful life. I am pursuing Jesus daily. I am walking with him. So God's word specifically tells us that the application of faith in our lives bring a, brings about outcomes that are, that are advantageous and that are beneficial to the Christian. So let's go to the text and see what it says. 1 John chapter 5, verse 1, I'll read it one more time. 
It says, Whosoever believeth that Jesus is the Christ is born of God, and every one that loveth him that begat loveth him, also that is begotten of him. I don't know about you, but when I read that in the King James, there's a lot of begottens and a lot of that's. What does it really mean? Well, here's the thing. We've talked about this throughout our study of 1 John. And here again, once again, we see God's word clearly define who his, or rather who is his. Those who believe upon Jesus, knowing him to be, the, be Christ. It's clearly defined. Belief in God, dependence upon Jesus, brings about a change. Wait a minute. You mean I can't just pray a prayer at an altar and be saved? Well, you can be. Amen. Uh, you mean I can't just attend church and be saved and, and be within the grace of God? Well, you can be. But unless, unless you were truly following Jesus Christ, there's a lot of people who pray prayers at altars and are going straight to hell. There are people who go to church faithfully. And they are going to spend an eternity in torment. Why? Because they don't have true, genuine, real faith. Belief in God, dependence upon Jesus, brings about a change in one's lifestyle. When one is saved, it brings about a new life. And that's the first point this morning. Faith results in a new life. But what is that new life of a follower of Jesus Christ? What exactly does that look like? What does it sound like? What does that mean that you get a new life? Well, the first epistle of John has given us insight as to what attributes you can see and what things are demonstrated in a new life of a Christian. And we'll just do a synopsis real quick as we're in the last chapter of 1 John of what we have been told through God's Word throughout this time. The first thing. The first attribute is faith in itself. That word believeth in verse 1 is not used here the same way we use it today. It instead describes the act of believing or rather trusting something on the basis of its truthfulness and reliability. Now, why do I say that it doesn't, it doesn't mean the same as how we use it today? Well, <clears throat> I believe that when I leave here, okay, I believe that when I leave here that I'm going to be able to go to Food Lion and pick up groceries. I believe it. But it would not shock me if someone came down with COVID and they had to shut down the store for a certain period of time. Amen? Amen. It would not shock me if something happened, if the business made bad investments and all of a sudden they shut their doors up because they're no longer solvent. That would not shock me. Because in this world, nothing is reliable. You can't depend on anything. But you see, I have a trust and a reliability in God because I know no matter what the economy does, what illness may come, I can always depend and count on God. See, that's the difference in the belief of today versus the belief that's here in 1 John. When I ask what your faith does for you, well, in a new life of a Christian, it, it's just that. It's faith. Faith in knowing that His Word is true. Faith in knowing that He's with you. Faith in knowing that no matter what you may encounter and what you may face, God is still the same. And He's still holding you right there in His hand. That's the difference. This is a saving belief. A saving faith. To quote the Free Will Baptist Treatise, Saving faith is an ascent of the mind to the fundamental truths of revelation. An acceptance of the gospel through the influence of the Holy Spirit in a firm confidence and trust in Christ. Not just a confidence, but a firm confidence. One that's not movable, shakable, or breakable. One that you can rely and depend upon. In Acts chapter 16, verse 31, God's word says, And they said, Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and thou shalt be saved in thy house. You want to know why the house can be saved? Because they see a true change in the person that put their faith in Jesus Christ. They see a new life in the person that has put their faith in Jesus Christ. So much so that now people look upon them and say, There's something different. 
They have a new life, and I want that too. The second attribute of a new life, and we've discussed that fact several times throughout the study of 1 John, but I turn your attention to chapter 4, 1 John chapter 4, verse 7. And if you're not a fast flipper, that's okay. I'm going to read it for you. 1 John chapter 4, verse 7, it says, Beloved, let us love one another, for love is of God, and everyone that loveth is born of God, and knoweth God. In our text this morning, we see that love is brought up again. And throughout 1 John, it's been brought up over and over and over again. And it supports the idea of not just having love for God, but if you truly love God, if, you, if you're truly following Jesus, if you have a genuine, real faith, if you have that new life of a Christian, then you're going to love His children also. You cannot claim to love God and not love your fellow uh, brothers and sisters in Christ, and we've talked about that at great lengths. Have you ever seen a brother or a sister fight? Maybe you have too. And not too long ago, I, I, I saw a brother and sister, and I'm not talking about young kids. I'm talking about people, people up in age. A brother and sister fighting over a house, a house that probably won't amount much to more than a couple of hundred thousand dollars. Now understand this, a couple of hundred thousand dollars is a lot of money to me, right? But is it really worth severing my love for a sibling? No. It's not, but for some people it is. Have you ever seen a brother and sister fight? Well, it's natural to have squabbles back and forth. You've heard, you've heard the term, you've heard the phrase, sibling rivalry. It's natural. But I'm talking about grown men and women who are biologically connected, who flat out dislike and do not care for one another. I've seen it happen more than once, as I'm sure you have too. Maybe you're even in that kind of relationship. I could be rude right now and say, I have a, I have a, a, a physical brother right, right, right back in the pew. I could say, I can't stand him right now, just to prove a point. It's, it's natural for people to have disagreements and differences, right? That's not true. I like him most of the time. <clears throat> Realistically, a person can love their earthly mother and father, but loathe and detest their siblings. But God's word says that's not the case. For the natural man and woman, sure, that's fine. But for a person who has a new life, that is not right. But that's of the carnal mind, it's not of the spirit. God's word says it's not the case. You cannot love the father with hate for your brothers and sisters. If there is hate... And dislike, that means that your relationship is strained with God. Remember that the church also is the bride of Christ, right? God's word tells us that. It's clearly demonstrated, clearly talked about. The church is the bride of Christ. I don't know about some of you, but if someone came to me and said, Brother Danny, we really like you. We like you a lot. Make myself feel good this morning. We don't just like you, we like you a lot. But I really can't stand that wife of yours, Crystal. How long do you think we're really going to be friends? Probably not long, right? Because how can you really like me and not like my wife, vice versa? I mean, you could. But understand this. If you say you're a Christian, that you have faith in Jesus Christ, you have that new life, and you hate your brother or sister in Christ, that's the same as looking at Jesus and saying, you know what, I love you, I adore you, I, I, I give you respect and adoration, but I can't stand your bride. That's what you're doing. And, and, and God's word clearly communicates there is no room for that in the life of a Christian. A third attribute in the new life in Christ is righteousness. 1 John chapter 2, verse 29 told us, If you know that he is righteous, you know that everyone that doeth righteous is born of him. Now, as a follower of Jesus Christ, you have been made a new creature. And that turns, that new creature turns from its old self. 
Righteousness, understand, is not a single act of submission, but rather, rather a lifelong pursuit of purity. That's what it means. Not just a one-time thing. And, and, and righteousness, uh, you understand when I say purity, uh, we are all, almost always want to, want to associate that in some type of sexual context. But that, that's what I'm not talking about. I'm talking about unadulterated lacking of any contamination of this world or the flesh. If you're of His, that is what the life of a Christian should be pursuing. A life of purity. One commentator puts it like this. Righteousness is, is an attribute of moral purity belonging to God alone. It is He alone who is truly righteous. No one in the world is righteous in the eyes of the Lord. That is, except the Christian. We are counted as righteous in the eyes of God when we receive Jesus by faith. Once again, there is that word, faith. What type of results comes from faith? A new life. What does that new life bring? It brings a change. It brings a shaking off of the old creature. It means that you have love for the Father. You demonstrate that by love for others. And then here, now, that means you are pursuing a life of holiness. That means you are pursuing a life that is unadulterated and uncontaminated by the filth of this world. Philippians chapter 3 verse 9 says, And be found in him, not having my own righteousness, which is of the law, but that which is through the faith of Christ. The righteousness which is of God by faith. Our righteousness is based upon what Jesus did on the cross. Amen? The righteousness that was Christ is counted to us. We then are seen as righteous in the eyes of God, but only because of faith and, and reliance and dependence and trust upon Jesus. Though we are actually worthy of damnation, we are made righteous by Jesus' sacrifice on the cross. Now, I don't know about you, but I'm thankful for that this morning. Because I know even if I tried to do everything perfect, I will still screw up. Now, it's hard to convince a lot of Christians of that, by the way, because they think they're perfect. Amen? I'm not even going to pick on the unbeliever this morning. There's a lot of Christians who think they do no wrong. They are perfect in the sight of God. And you know what they do? They seek out people that, that will tell them, yeah, you're right. You're, you're doing the right thing. That's like a person who, who, who asks a question, types a question into a search engine like Google because it will produce the results they want to get. Is COVID bad? They're going to find something that says COVID is bad. And I'm not saying COVID is not bad. That's not my insinuation. But they phrase the question in such a way they produce the results they want. Christians do that all the time. But thank God for Jesus and the cross. Because our righteousness is but filthy rags. But because of Him, we are seen as pure before God in heaven. Isaiah chapter 61 verse 10 tells us this. I will greatly rejoice in the Lord. My soul shall be joyful in my God, for he hath clothed me in the garments of salvation. He hath covered me with the robe of righteousness, as a bridegroom decketh himself with ornaments, and as a bride adorneth herself with her jewels. Do you rejoice in the fact that you're a follower of Jesus Christ? The fourth attribute. Though closely tied with the third, is an incapacity to sin. By the way, these are four attributes on my first point. I know it's only 1235. I'm watching you. An incapacity to sin. 1 John chapter 3, verse 9 tells, told us this. Whosoever is born of God doth not commit sin. For his seed remaineth in him. And he cannot sin because he is born of God. Now let me ask you. Once again, I asked you at the beginning. Are you a follower of Jesus Christ this morning? Have you been washed by the blood of the Lamb? Have you been born again? Whatever phrase you want to put, here's the question. Do you have complete and total trust? On Jesus Christ. A firm confidence that He has the ability 
to wash away all sins so that you can stand before God righteous? If your answer is yes, then understand this, that sin is incompatible with your lifestyle now. In that new life in Jesus Christ, sin does not work. Sin should be a a vexation of your spirit. Sin should, should, should cause you to feel... Terrible is not even a good enough word to describe it. If you have the same desires, if you have the same ambitions, if you have the same habits, if you have the same thoughts... That, can, uh, that contradicted God before you being saved, hmm. you'd better not have them now in your new life in Christ. They better be different. If you, if, if you do, if you do have the same thoughts, the same passions, the same wants, if you do have the same ambitions, the same, the same thoughts, then you need to take them to God. Because understand, those things are incompatible with your new life as a follower of Jesus Christ. You need to ask God to take them away from you. You need to have them cut from your heart. You need to to pray to God that they would be expunged from your mind. Extinguish them from your wants. 1 John chapter 3, verse 9 said this, Whosoever is born of God doth not commit sin, for his seed remaineth in him, and he cannot sin, because he is born of God. Now a lot of people look at that verse and say, that means sinless perfection. If you sin one time, you are out of the grace of God. No. Whoever, whoever reads that one verse, sure, you take that away. But in, in, in the Bible's entirety... You're not reading the same Bible as I am if it's saying that one sin is going to separate you from from the grace of God. But what it is saying is this. Is that if you're spending more time trying to figure out how much sin you can get away with to not make God angry, then your heart's in the wrong place to begin with. If the first thing you do when you're being convicted, by the way, the human conscience a lot of times, if it's something you really want, won't tell you this is wrong. As a matter of fact, it'll give you ways to justify your actions within your mind. But if, but if something's telling you, if something's, if something's eating at you about the fact that what you're doing is not right, then guess what? That is the Holy Spirit, and it's time to be obedient to that leading. The second point I have for you this morning is that faith is reinforced by Jesus. 1 John chapter 5, verses 2-4 through four says this, By this we know that we love the children of God when we love God and keep His commandments. For this is the love of God that we keep His commandments and His commandments are not grievous. For whatsoever is born of God overcometh the world and this is the victory that overcometh the world, even our faith. Verse 2 continues to talk about the love for your brothers and sisters in Christ, for my brothers and sisters in Christ. But then, there's an additional layer added on. So not only should you have faith, not only should you have love for God, not only do you demonstrate that love for God by loving others, but now there's another layer added on top of it. Not only do you substantiate your love for God by loving His children, but you also do so by keeping His commandments, by obeying His word, by adhering to it. God what ups Himself here because His word says not only does the Christian keep His commandments, but get this, you're not only supposed to do what God's word says, but then it's not burdensome for you. It's It's not a headache for you. Love for God and keeping His commandments Understand, go hand in hand. This is duplicating, by the way, what Jesus told us in the Gospel of John, chapter 14. What did He say? I'll tell you what He said. He said, if you love Me, keep My commandments. In the Gospel of John, chapter 15, verse 10, Jesus also said, if you keep My commandments, ye shall abide in My love, even as I have kept My Father's commandments, and abide in His love. So let's, so let's just stop. Not that I haven't been honest so far, but let's just get real with one another. This morning, 
from a little bit more intimate crowd here in church. I can look all of you in the eye multiple times. It might make you uncomfortable, but I kind of like it. <clears throat> What's that? Uh, you can't talk low. I can't hear you. <clears throat> We're human beings. Amen? I think everybody can agree with that. And as followers of Jesus, our souls occupy this flesh which fights us. We live in a world that opposes us and we're attacked by an enemy that has no other ambition or desire than to defeat us. You will fail to live up to this caliber of Christian. It's impossible. But your desires, your ambitions... Your wants should all be focused on keeping true to the teachings of Jesus Christ. <laughs> you shouldn't use the fact, well, I'm just a, I'm just a mortal. I, I'm just a human being. Why should I even try? Because, see, that thought process is not the thought process of a new creature. It's not the thought process of someone who puts their faith in Jesus Christ. It's not the thought process of a person who has a new life. Now the word here says that keeping God's commandments should not be grievous, should, should not be burdensome, should not weigh you down. And if you just pluck out that one verse without looking at it in its context, it seems as if it's saying that living a life that's faithful to Christ is easy. That it will never be hard for you. That means it's saying that being sinless is easy. And I mean, after all, Jesus did say in in Matthew chapter 11, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. But John is not writing this letter to lead people on to say that keeping God's commandments is, is undemanding, is unchallenging, is, is, is no sweat involved. That's not the intent. Instead, the heart of the message is that the commandments should not fill burdensome. But what do you mean by that? You don't feel as if your whole life is crushed and even that it has ended because you're following Jesus Christ. You don't have to have the attitude that would say or think, oh man, you know, I would love to do this and I could do this if only I wasn't a follower of Christ. You know, I, I'd do that if only I didn't go to church. I would do that if only and fill in the blank. No, because in a new life, that new creature, all the other stuff wouldn't matter. You wouldn't, you wouldn't feel it burdensome to do what the Word of God says. I'm going to give you an example of that, by the way. Since we're being honest this morning, here's my example. A couple of months ago, I saw that there was a, a particular group that was touring the United States. And I said, you know what? This, this is something I've wanted to do since I was a kid. This, this was a band I've wanted to see. I mean, you talk about a bucket list of things you want to do before, before you depart this earth. Well, I always wanted to see a Dallas Cowboys and Redskins game. I'm sorry, the Washington football team's game. Um, I've always wanted to see one of those games live. I did that. There's a few other things on my quote-unquote bucket list I wanted to do. But understand, Sister Ann, seeing this band was on that bucket list. So I, I looked up, and, and they were going to be near Baltimore in September. A portion of me said, well, we'll never make it to September because they'll shut everything back down because of COVID. <clears throat> but you know what? And it was a rarity that this band tours. Now, I'm not going to tell you who the band is because I don't want to embarrass myself. You'll laugh at me. But, but it, it's such a rarity that this band tours that the tour that they're on is called the Not In This Lifetime Tour. Now, the ones who are smiling knows who it is, so I don't feel bad about liking this band. So here's this. Here's this. How harmless can this be? Just going to see a bit. That, that's, not, that's not detrimental to, to my walk with Christ. You go listen to some songs, and you come home. You got to live that experience. But as I was shopping for tickets, one, tickets for concerts are outrageous nowadays. You see how often I go to concerts. But past that, I was trying, I was, I was thinking in my mind, 
what if, what if someone from church saw me there? Now, here's the thing. If someone wanted to give me a hard time for seeing me there and they were from church, by the way, I said, what are you doing here? But understand this. If the fact that there might be something wrong with it, the fact that I might have felt like it would be damaging to my testimony, forget my ministry, just my testimony of representing Christ. There must be something that's plaguing me not to go. There must be a reason why God put it on my heart. Maybe you shouldn't do this. The person I was going to go with asked me a couple of weeks ago. They said, hey, did you buy those tickets by, by any chance? I said, no. And guess what? I didn't lose anything. I didn't leave anything behind. I'm not, I'm not sitting around saying, man, I missed that opportunity. I may never get it again. Because the Lord put it on my heart. You don't need to be there. You're not missing anything there. And that might seem so small and tiny to you. But as I read God's word, if I'm faithful with the small things, <laughs> then, then I'm, I'm, that much, I'm that much more ready to handle the big things that requires faith. Here's the question. What has our faith done? What does your faith do? Why do we, why do we look for ways to see how much of this world we can have with saying, if I die today, I'll still go to heaven? Because if we want to be honest with one another this morning, if, if the challenge here in 1 John chapter 5 in the first five verses is this, if we all take a long look in the mirror, we have to realize that we struggle with the fact that we love, let me rephrase, we don't struggle with the fact that we love God. Some of us may struggle with love for brothers and sisters in Christ, but I would even say a good portion of us don't struggle with that. But then we get to the point of saying, that we have to keep His commandments and they're not burdensome, oh, there, there's times when we say, wow, we would do things differently. If it, weren't for, if it weren't for following God, I even made the, I even made this, and without even thinking, now I'm getting convicted in the pulpit. I made the example yesterday, there was somebody who told me they had problems with their neighbors, their neighbors would go out and shoot guns if their dogs were out in the back. I said, you know what I would do? I'd wait till 5 o'clock. I'd get a line of M80s, and I'd just go right beside the window, and I'd light it on fire. I probably wouldn't do that now, but once upon a time, I'd have done that. How many times do you think that? Now, I mean, I didn't find anywhere in the Bible, thou shalt not set off M80s at 5 o'clock in the morning. But here's the thing. Why is it that we feel that our life is somehow, somehow damaged? Why do we feel as if we've somehow been robbed of something because we follow Jesus Christ? Because the Bible tells us, God's Word tells us that if we're following Christ, then keeping His commandments should not be burdensome. There are things in your life where everything in you, from a fleshly perspective, wants to partake. But we have a way for those things not to overtake us because faith is reinforced by Jesus Christ. You see, you notice in every example I gave you, it was all about, oh, I, I, I. But in, in, when you're a new creature, when you have that new life in Christ, it's no longer about you. It's no longer about me. It's about Jesus. It is it's faith reinforced by Jesus. It's, it's accompanied with the Holy Spirit who leads, who assists, and who equips us to pursue a life of virtue with God. <laughs> You can fight and resist any temptation. With Jesus, you can avoid any pitfall. You can stay out of the filth of this world because, uh, by the way, not because of your might or your strength, but because of Jesus' power and His love. Romans chapter 8, verses 38 and 39 tells us this, For I am persuaded that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other creature shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Jesus Christ our Lord. Now, if you take those verses in Romans to heart, that means there is nothing in this life that you're going to face that you have to worry about being defeated upon. Nothing. 
And does that mean you'll never, you'll never lose in an aspect of, from a worldly perspective? You mean I'm always going to get that job? I'm always going to get that raise? I'm always, going to, I'm always going to be healthy and never, ever have to worry about an illness? Does it mean any of that? No, but what it means is, is no matter what you're put through, no matter what storm you're sailing through, no matter what problem you face, <laughs> you can know that with God, it's going to turn out okay. The third point I have for you this morning is that faith routes out this world. And understand routes, uh, it, it, that's, an, that's an interesting word. Has, it's not used a lot in common vernacular in this day and age. Let me put it in a way that you might understand it a little more. My third point is that faith defeats the world. It overcomes this world. 1 John chapter 5, verses 4 and 5 say, For whatsoever is born of God overcometh the world. And this is the victory that overcometh the world, even our faith. Who is he that overcometh the world? But he that believeth that Jesus is the Son of God. With Jesus you are given the power to avoid the world's enticements. That, that pull, that draw from the world, with faith you have the ability to stamp that out. Disregard, dis, uh, disregard the world's combinations. Be cognizant of, but not be absorbed by the world's heresy. Shun the world's loathing. Ignore its antagonism. And not fear its oppression. All of it has no power over you. The world, Satan, has no power over you when you are walking with Christ. When you have faith in God. And how does one do this? Well, as Henry Spence puts it, he says this, they will maintain the fight earnestly, fearlessly, joyously, persistently, even to the end. All throughout or all through the unconquerable might imparted by Him in whom they believe. By the way, that's Jesus, the Son of God. The only one. Understand, the only one that can gain victory over. The only one who can overcome the world. Is the one who puts their faith, trust, and dependence upon Jesus Christ. So remember the question. Do you have faith in Jesus? Great. What can your faith do? What has your faith done? Do you have faith? And if your answer is yes, what do you have faith in? Really? What is your faith in? What can your faith do? Because understand this, genuine, sincere, real a firm confidence of real faith in Jesus results in a new life. It's reinforced by the Savior and has the ability to overcome all. Faith caused Noah to heed God, God's warning, build and set foot on the ark. Faith caused Abraham to be attentive to God's calling and go into unspecified land. God caused Noah to reject the title as uh, uh, the, the title of son of Pharaoh's daughter to choose instead to experience affliction right there with God's people. God, or excuse me, faith caused Joshua to march around a fortified city with instruments, counting on the fact that he would be victorious and that city would fall. Faith caused Gideon and David to conquer kingdoms and reap divine promises. And if you don't want to take my word for it, and you say, Brother Danny, that's going through all the Old Testament, just go to Hebrews chapter 11. You can read all about it. Faith can do amazing things. It did it then, and it can do it right now. What has your faith done for you? What are the results? Faith in Jesus is victorious. It's jubilant. Faith is life-changing and it's course-correcting. And I'll end with God's Word here. In the book of Romans, chapter 1, verse 17, God's Word says this, 
For therein is the righteousness of God, revealed from faith to faith. As it is written, the just shall live by faith. Will you pray with me this morning? Father, thank you so much once again for the opportunity to be in this house. Father, I am thankful. Father, I am thankful that I can look about that I can look over my walk with Jesus and I can see results. I can see a difference in desire and a difference in thoughts, a difference in motivation, a difference in intent. Father, I'm thankful. As Sister Tammy testified this morning, I am, I am thankful that you saved a wretch like me. Father, I pray this morning that if there's anyone in this house that does not have true and genuine faith, that, that believes themselves to be a Christian but is Christian in name only, Father, I pray this morning that you call out to them Father, whether they're in this house or whether they're listening online, Father, I pray that you reach out to them. And Father, I pray that they take that initial step of faith and put their their reliance and dependence upon Jesus Christ. Knowing them never to be righteous of their own doings or abilities. But Father, only made righteous because of the precious blood of the Lamb that was shed on the cross at Calvary. For those who put their faith in it. Father, if there's anyone who is not truly born again, I pray this is the day that happens. Father, for the Christian, I pray that as they look over their life, they can see, they can see that the old self has, has, has died. They can see that their old self and their thoughts and their wants And their intents and their motivations are gone away. And now they are focused on you. And Father, that they adhere to your word. And that it's not burdensome for them. Father, I pray for those who may be complacent in their faith. That they reach out to you and ask for a renewing of spirit. For a renewing of their heart. For a renewing of their faith. And Father, I pray that those those desires and those intentions and and those motivations that they have will be taken away. Father, search our hearts and convict us. Reprove us of those things in which that should not be there, that's incompatible with our new life in Jesus. And Father, I pray this morning for the backslidden Christian, not complacent, not, not on fire for God, but is slowly drifting away from what your word says and is being drawn further and further away and back into this world. Father, I pray for them also. I pray for conviction from you. I pray from leading from the Holy Spirit that they get right from you or with you, Father. Father, I pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen.